I know a few good stories. They take place in a corner of America that might seem familiar, yet still manages to surprise. The settings are spectacular, the characters compelling, the action exciting, the plot lines unpredictable. I'm Tom Richardson. Join me as I explore New England's great outdoors, from Candlewood Lake, Connecticut to Caribou, Maine, from the beaches of Cape Cod to the peaks of New Hampshire's White Mountains. Stories are waiting. Let's live them on Explore New England. Explore New England is presented by your New England Ford dealers, your local REI co-op, REI believes a life outside is fundamental to a life well lived. Campers in RV and visitnewengland.com. Additional funding and support for this episode was provided by the Maine Office of Tourism, the Rangeley Lakes Chamber of Commerce, and Eagle Nest Outfitters. The Kennebago is a storied river home to a population of native brook trout, some topping five pounds, that has drawn generations of anglers to the Rangeley Lakes region of western Maine since the 1800s. As a freestone river, its waters often warm past the comfort level of big trout during the summer months. And that makes spring, June in particular, a prime time to fish the Kennebago especially if you want to experience the thrill of catching native brookies on dry flies. All this and more I learned while fishing with guide Mona Brewer, who was lucky enough to live near the Kennebago for a good part of the year. Mona guides on the river and gives fly fishing lessons from May to September, and she was kind enough to show me a few of her favorite spots on a recent spring visit. Well, what happens is the fish on the lower river are coming up from um, Rangeley and they're moving up to get more food, but they have to have the river temperature right and the hatches right and the food right. So they're starting, they're starting to move up now. Um, and they'll, the fishing here will get really, really good in the next week or two. Or three, we hope. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, if we get some hatches, the water will warm up a little bit, mm -hmm. and the, the big fish will really move up, and you'll get in here some nice fish. You like can, what, what size? I would. You can get some 16, 17, 18. Out of one of the other pools, some people have gotten some 20 inch. Whoa. Yes. <laughs> and then the water gets warm, and when it gets warm, they go back down, or they get into a deep pool, and they just kind of hang out for the summer. You know what? Bigger than my other one. <laughs> it's, not a, it's, it's, a, it's not a trout. It's not a trout. Not a trout. It's a trout. Oh well. <laughs> like, hey, you know what? Like I said, it's getting bigger. Look at the mouth on that thing, huh? It's not something you catch on purpose. <laughs> I first got into fishing because my dad was a big fisherman. He liked to trout fish and he liked to bass fish. And when I was a little girl, we'd go out in the boat and we would fish. And I was more interested probably in what I was wearing and other things than the fish. But we would fish for bass and lily pads and collect bugs and frogs. And that's how I started fishing. I think fishing in the experience that it brings to people is they meet really great people but they get to be outside and they get to be in nature. I think of fishing kind of like yoga to some people or meditation to some people. Oh, this is not a job. I don't think this is a job. It's what it's a tiny fish whatever. Ah, let me see. Looks like a salmon, yep. 
Actually, actually no, that, that's a that's a, tr a brook trout, I think. Yep, he got off. Take care of you because we love you. Oh, look at that little thing. Isn't it pretty? Okay, okay. You should have <laughs> We got one. You got one. Yeah. Well. <laughs> All oh, right, we're on much. the board. Yeah. Is this you? So the reason that we settled here in Maine is because we love Maine. We've lived in Maine for 40 years, just as part-time. We're not residents of Maine. And when we had to make a decision on retirement, on where we wanted to be, we wanted to be near family. We have a long history with friends in Maine, and we wanted to keep that alive. We didn't want to lose that. But yet we wanted to be in a wilderness area. And what's great about this part of Maine too is you can get in your car or truck and you can ride, ride, ride on dirt roads and just see all the wildlife which is wonderful, and you don't see a lot of people. Not that we don't love people, we do, but it's, it's just a great place to be. Even if the action isn't red hot, there's still plenty to see on the Kennebago, including birds, deer, fox, moose, and the occasional beaver, all of which can prove distracting when you're trying to concentrate on catching fish. did not succeed in hooking one of the Kennebago's legendary trophy trout. I had a great time fishing with Mona, who shares a legacy among Rangeley's female anglers started by Cornelia Flyrod Crosby, the first registered guide in Maine. Crosby received that honor in 1897, when the Rangeley region was considered one of the premier fishing destinations in the country, if not the entire world. To learn more about Rangeley's sporting origins, I paid a visit to the splendid Outdoor Heritage Museum in the village of Aquasic. So this exhibit is about George Shepard Page. Um, he was a very wealthy, successful businessman um, who had been born in Maine but um, made his fortune in New York. Well, he had family um, in the area and he came to visit one day and had a really great catch of brook trout um, and was so impressed with it that he decided to send this catch back to New York City to tell everybody all about it. I got um, spot burning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well here we have um, what we believe to be the oldest example of a Rangeley boat. Uh, this region was um, well known for this specific boat, which was created really for guides to be able to take their sports, their anglers, um, out on the water. Um, it was crafted to be really sturdy, really durable, to be able to um, have a good amount of stability in the high winds and sometimes high waves on uh, the Rangeley Lakes region. So it's, it's unique to the area. Um, they are still constructed today and there's really interesting history of Barrett family and then Herb Ellis um, and several other makers that 
really perfected this craft of, of building these beautiful boats. Yep, all uh, last year. Another woman who contributed to Rangeley fishing lore was fly tying legend Carrie Stevens, originator of the famous Grey Ghost streamer pattern. An entire section of the museum is dedicated to Stevens and her fish fooling creations. Yeah, that was her most famous pattern, and you know, it was developed um, right there at Upper Dample. That's cool, what a history. Mm -hmm. While the lure of large trout and salmon continued to draw sportsmen to the Rangeley Lakes region, it was a humbler species that infected me with the fishing bug when I visited Rangeley at the age of five. Those yellow perch were gathered while on a family camping trip to Rangeley Lake State Park back in 1971, and the experience launched a lifelong passion. The 718-acre park and campground remained largely unchanged since my first visit, as I discovered on a tour with park manager Scott Bevins. Rangeley State Park was established in 1960. Uh, it's approximately 870 acres, um, and it's used year-round um, by snow enthusiasts or campers or fishing people, um, uh, and it's very popular because it's so quiet. The park features a total of 50 single party sites, including numerous RV sites equipped with electric and water hookups. A central bathhouse offers hot showers and firewood can be purchased at the front entrance. Rounding out the facilities are a swimming beach, playground, picnic area, and a launch ramp with finger docks that are available free of charge to campers. Due to the park's popularity, it's recommended that campers reserve a site through the state's online reservation system. If camping isn't your thing, there are much less rustic places to spend the night in the Rangeley Lakes region, including the historic Rangeley Inn and Tavern. The sprawling inn harkens to Rangeley's heyday as a summer resort and offers a host of comfortable, well-appointed rooms and suites, along with a grand dining room where guests can enjoy breakfast and a cozy tavern. The Rangeley Inn has a really elaborate history starting back in the mid-1800s. Uh, when a family that resided in the house that is now our tavern, where our bar is located, uh, started renting rooms to boarders, and then they decided to build a hotel attached to that. Uh, they built what is now called the Rangeley Lake House. Uh, that was the first hotel that stood here, built in the mid-1800s, and then in the late 1800s they picked that up and they moved it over to the shore of Rangeley Lake, uh, in the dead of winter, of course. Uh, and then several years later in 1907, that is when construction started on what is now the Rangeley Inn. Uh, there are three wings to the building, so we have the main section here. We have what we refer to as the Ellis Wing, and that's right over on this side here. That was originally another inn located next door called the Fraser Inn. That was built in 1900 and then they picked that up, moved it over, and attached it to this building in 1919. I grew up in southern Maine. I grew up down in Agunquit, which is a beach town, very different from Rangeley, uh, but I've always been fond of hiking and kayaking and getting up to the mountains, and when this went up for auction nine years ago, I saw it as an opportunity to uh, continue in the hospitality business like I had grown up in, uh, but to be in an area where I could do the things that I enjoy so much. Many of the inn's suites overlook Haley Pond, which I got to know better on an afternoon kayak tour with Linda Dexter, the founder of Echo Pelagicon Outfitters and soon to be new owner Seth La Liberty. What I really, my favorite or what I really like about the Rangeley region is how many opportunities you have right here. You know we're a four season place. I love to fish. There's the, the best fishing 
really some of the best brook trout fishing in the world, I would say, is right here in our backyard. Um, I love to ski. We have Saddleback Mountain, we have Sugarloaf Mountain, all the mountains in New Hampshire are close. Um, we have tons of ponds and lakes and rivers to explore by kayak or canoe, and the mountains. It's there's it's like one of the most beautiful places. When you drive over, like the one thing that gets me every time after 20 years is when you drive up by the IGA and you're coming down into town, with like Spotted Mountain and all the mountains in the background, and it's green and it's just a special place, you know. And the people, you know, for a small town in northern Maine, the people you get to meet that pass through this town that come here are just always really unique and interesting, like. You know, people doing speed hikes in the AT. You know, you meet these famous like trail runners and just like run into them on the trail. It's just, uh, if you like the outdoors, it's the place to be. So Haley Pond is part of the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. And a few years back, the uh, a volunteer group from the Canoe Trail and Ronnie Haynes, whose uh, name is on the sign over there. Um, Haynes built, Landing. Haynes Landing. <laughs> built um, a lean-to in the woods. There's a whole set of trails that goes up to the museum and um, the lean-to is used by paddlers. There's a, an outhouse up there. They've called it, they call it the Halfway Hilton because Rangeley is halfway through the Northern Forest Canoe Trail. This is the midpoint. And where does it go from here? Up to Fort Kent. Fort Kent and it, the other way? Uh, Old Forge. Okay. 740 miles. Um, it follows the traditional Native American trade routes. Having worked up an appetite, not to mention thirst, on my Haley Pond paddle, I headed down the road to Parkside in Maine. The casual restaurant features an extensive menu of tasty dishes, and I made short work of some coconut shrimp and fish tacos while sitting on the deck overlooking City Cove at the eastern end of Rangeley Lake. Parkside also carries a wide range of craft brews, curated by ale aficionado Will Adelson, who treated me to a rare Ghost in the Machine hazy IPA from Louisiana, of all places. Rangeley, it turns out, is full of surprises. The woods and waters of the Rangeley Lakes region have long attracted nature lovers, including those seeking to observe animals in their natural habitat. Small wonder, then, that acclaimed wildlife photographer Nick Ledley set down roots in the area. I joined Nick on an early morning photography session in search of some winged subject matter, of which there is plenty, especially if you know where to look. Late May through June is prime time for birding in and around Rangeley, as many migratory species are arriving to breed or flying through on their way north. The male magnolia warbler, and he's always here in this spot every spring, like clockwork. It's a yellow rump warbler, affectionately known as a butterbutt. <laughs> well, we got a warbler. That's good. You need a great deal of patience to be a successful bird photographer, as the subjects often remain tantalizingly hidden among the foliage revealing themselves sometimes only momentarily. We heard several species of warbler calling amid the trees, but only managed to capture one on camera. Fortunately, a very cooperative nuthatch later provided some close-range photo ops. Well, how I got into nature photography is a really good question. Um, I probably actually spent 10 to 12 years working for newspapers and just kind of burned out on it and you know gave up that line of work and said well what am i going to go do now and you know i was always raised in the outdoors you know we always hunted and fished when i was a kid and i said well you know going to doing nature and wildlife work you know, is, isn't that much of a leap for me um 
I sort of had to relearn photography a lot because it's a completely different style. There's a lot, a lot you have to learn. Um, you know, well, a lot of which, and a lot of that has to do with, you know, field techniques, how to approach species, things like that. Um, but it's, in some ways, it's not that far removed from working for newspapers because it's still somewhat documentary in its nature. So that's kind of how I got started, and that was in 2003. So I've been at this for nearly 20 years now. How would I describe the Rangeley area and its attractions? It's definitely the amount of outdoor activities that you could do up here. I mean, snowmobiling, cross-country skiing, downhill skiing, canoeing, kayaking, fishing, hunting, ATVing. You know, we, we got it all. Um, you know, and it, it's a great place to photograph too. It's one of my favorite places to go out and just explore around here with a camera because they know never what I'm going to find and I'm always finding new places. And you know, there's so many miles of logging roads out there that stuff is accessible. So you never run out, of, you, 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 you don't see yourself ever getting bored of this area. You don't, no. you, you never run out of things to photograph. No, I'll, I'll never get bored of the range of the area and I can always find something to photograph somewhere. Another good place to observe birds, especially raptors, is Saddleback Mountain, which is best known for downhill skiing. During the warmer months, however, hikers can take advantage of the trails that cover various parts of the mountain, including one linking to a section of the Appalachian Trail. And now there's a new game on the slopes. Just recently, Saddleback built a network of mountain bike trails to take advantage of the terrain and the resort's chairlift system. I got a chance to check it out with Mountain Operations Manager, Jared Emerson. So Jared, when did you guys like build these trails? Uh, we did all these in uh, the summer of 21. Mm -hmm. um, we did it basically June, July, August, September timeframe. Uh, when the dirt's the driest and kind of the, the easiest to, to work with at that point. Right, and how, now, how, now did you design the trail itself or do you bring in an outside consultant? How does that work? Yeah, we did design them in-house. Um, a, uh, uh, a few folks got together, we're all kind of, uh, we ride, and we consulted with other uh, local parks and other professionals and just kind of did some walkthroughs with our virgin ground to discuss how we were going to build our, uh, our trails and and uh, do some initial flagging and kind of decide what some of your general layouts would be, identify your, your low spots, your wet spots, your high spots, maybe obstacles that are gonna be in the way or obstacles that you want to incorporate and turn into features. You know, you do some kind of uh, some run-throughs that way and just get a general layout of how you're, how you're gonna build the trail. Uh, mountain biking is something that I've just been into. I don't actually know why, but I've been into it for a really long time, since I was a kid. It was something that I did. I was a kid that grew up uh, kind of back in the woods, uh, off the paved roads, half mile dirt road to get to my house. All my friends uh, were kind of in the same situation. We were all outdoorsy kids and we just got a hold of bikes and started riding and uh, mountain biking became a passion of ours. Um, early on and uh, it was great. It was great fun. Uh, that was uh, a much less refined sort of uh, sport back then. It was riding through the woods and logging roads and rough paths and all sorts of crazy stuff and mountain bikes that really uh, didn't, whatever, deserve that sort of abuse probably. And what's your favorite cure or solution for avoiding black flies? Oh, the black flies. You know, I think that there isn't really a cure for avoiding them. I think that the key uh, to success in, in uh, combating them is to just become their friends. That's all that there is to it. All, they want to be your friend. They want to hang out around you. You just got to let them. You can't fight them off too bad. It is what it is. From mountain biking to fly fishing, birding to paddling, modern day Rangeley continues to serve as a paradise for those who seek outdoor adventure. And while spring may be black fly season, those who appreciate this quieter time of year, when the fishing is best, learn to live with the annoying insects, even if they don't exactly turn out to be friends. <laughs> 